Something we've been asked an awful lot in our video comments is to give examples of how we live a self-sufficient life from month to month throughout the year. So today, we're starting that series. Welcome to English Country Life, my name's Fiona and together with my husband Hugh we live here on a little small holding in the UK and what we try and do is live a self-sufficient lifestyle. Now in the UK they're called small holdings, in the US they're called homesteads and we grow as much of our own fruit, vegetables, we make a lot of our own household goods and we do most of the maintenance on the property all ourselves and we've been asked to show month by month how that lifestyle actually works so what we're going to do in this series is we're going to take you through each month and we're going to start in the middle of the year here in July because this is when we're harvesting and you get to see all of the things which we're actually growing and what we're actually doing with them to make sure that we can eat them all through the year we do harvest our own firewood, we do make household polish, we do make our own soap. So there's so much to show you. But let's get started with July. One of the things that we love and we grow a lot of is soft fruit, berries and currants and all those other delicious things. And it occupies a lot of our time at this time of year. We have to work on it almost every single day. So let me give you a quick tour and show you the sorts of things we're up to. These are our strawberry beds and like all our fruit and veg beds, they are four foot wide, 25 foot long, so 100 square feet. We normally have three for strawberries, but this year, We've only got one in productive use because every few years you have to move your strawberries to a new bed. Otherwise you get a buildup of disease, you get nutrients exhausted. So like all crops, they have to be rotated and that's quite an undertaking. So this year, the other fruit's gonna have to pick up some of the strain because we've only got 100 square foot of strawberries. But you'd be surprised how much that produces. We love these long, low trucks for harvesting soft fruit because it doesn't get crushed in a nice big wide flat layer. But we could fill that several times over from a single strawberry bed and still come back two days later and start all over again. I also have another basket. You might wonder why that type. Well, some of the strawberries may have gone over a little bit. They might have a little bit of damage to them. So they're not the sort of thing we want to preserve, but the chickens still love them. This is our fruit cage. It's a fully netted enclosure on a larger scale to the one we do with the strawberries. And with soft fruit, if you don't net it, the birds are going to get most of it, trust me. On this side, we've got a thornless blackberry, this huge triffid like plant that Fiona actually carefully pruned earlier in the year. It's unbelievably vigorous and produces a huge amount of fruit. And on this side, we have two runs of raspberries. Now that's an interesting thought. Why two runs of raspberries? Well, look at the price of raspberries in the supermarket, but those kind of economics don't apply when you're trying to live a self-sufficient life. It's about what you can grow, not what somebody else is gonna charge you for it. So we grow a lot of raspberries, because I love them. Let's take a look then. Look at these beautiful, plump raspberries. Now we grow them all. We grow primocanes, we grow floricanes, and I can explain the difference if anyone's interested. We also grow these little yellow ones, and they are tremendous. Now the thing you've got to remember though, with this kind of soft fruit, is you've got to pick it every day or two. It doesn't last, so you've got to pick and preserve. So what are we actually trying to do here? Well, there's two ways of growing fruit and vegetables. One is for immediate consumption, and that's a good thing to do. So you're actually picking the fruit and vegetables straight away and you're eating it immediately. And the taste is so much better than anything in the supermarket. Or you can grow for a glut, so you can enjoy the fruits of your labour all through the year. And these are examples of some of our preserving methods, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, in our case, we're doing a bit of both. So we are growing for immediate consumption, but we're also trying to create a glut, so we can have those fruits and vegetables which we really enjoy all through the year. But if we're growing for a glut, we have to grow quite a lot because preserving methods are really, really quite labor intensive. So what we want to do is make that process as, as efficient as possible. So we're gonna grow a lot so we can preserve a lot in one go. 
We've also made some other choices because we don't have limitless space here. We do have limited resources to be able to grow. And what we're going to do with that space is we've made a choice. We're going to grow high value items. So if we had to go to a shop to buy the goods, we would rather plant something which is going to be very expensive to buy than something very cheap. As an example, potatoes. In this area, we can buy a 20 kilo sack of potatoes for about eight pounds. So it's very, very cheap. But 250 grams of raspberries is going to cost us nearly three or four pounds. So if we've got a choice between growing potatoes or growing raspberries, obviously we're going to grow those raspberries. As a result, we have a lot of soft fruit because that's very expensive. Then we do grow things like potatoes, but we've made a conscious choice to grow things which we are definitely going to eat. So we've looked at our standard shopping basket before we moved here, and we've basically reproduced that in our fruit and vegetable garden. So I am a fruit junkie, so I eat raspberries, strawberries, rhubarb, gooseberries, you name it, I eat it like it's going out of fashion. But we also love, Hugh loves parsnips, so we will grow parsnips, even though they're quite cheap to buy. We'll grow carrots, we'll grow some potatoes. But we've also experimented with some things. So we've given a small amount of space each year to something which is a little unusual. And we've discovered there are a few things which you would never buy in a supermarket that we really like. One of those is something called Jerusalem artichokes and it's a tuber. It's a potato replacement and it's so tasty and the other great thing about it is essentially acts like a perennial because those tubers keep coming back year on year on year and if you harvest three quarters and leave a quarter in the ground it will just keep coming back. It's amazing and that's the final point in terms of our planning for fruit and vegetables. We are trying to move to perennials. So these are things which continually come back year on year. So our, those are our soft fruit bushes, our strawberries, our raspberries, our currants. Those are perennial plants. We're growing less and less of the annual. So those are things where we have to sow the seed every single year. And that's just because it's more efficient. Even with the vegetables, we've now given over quite a bit of space to asparagus because that's a perennial vegetable too. And what I want to talk about now is a little bit more about the preserving. So Hugh's going to take you through some of the preserving methods so we can enjoy a lot of these fruits and vegetables all through the year. I touched on the idea that we preserve fruit because I don't necessarily subscribe to this eat local, eat seasonal type of approach. We want to eat incredibly local, but in the middle of winter, there is no fresh fruit available. So actually what we're going to do is grow an excess in the summer, preserve it so that we can enjoy it in the winter. And that needs a variety of techniques. And let me touch on the humble strawberry to illustrate my point. If you freeze a strawberry, like we've frozen these gooseberries, when you defrost it, it's going to turn to absolute mush. It's going to be vile. So what do we do? Well, we slice them up, we put them through the dehydrator, and we make these wonderful dried strawberries. Now, I'll tell you what, you add some of those to a humble bowl of porridge, and you've got something really, really special. But you can also rehydrate them, you can turn them into fruit compots. They will last in this form for several years without any need for freezing or refrigeration. It's brilliant. And we do the same thing to raspberries. Now, I struggle to get raspberries to last as long because I love raspberries. And these, when dried, are like little meringues, like little raspberry meringues. They're incredible. But there's all sorts of other techniques, even with just drying. Think about rhubarb. You can't dry a stick of rhubarb. But if you cut it up, stew it up, dry it in sheets like that, what you get at the end is fruit leather. It's kind of like those fruit roll-ups they sell for kids. And it's incredible. It's tangy. It's zingy. It's wonderful. Other things that we grow, medlars. That's a medlar tree over there. It's breaking its back with fruit. And we produce this wonderful savoury jelly. You can have it on toast, but it's brilliant with cold meat. We do all the usual stuff. We produce jams. We produce jellies. And we can a lot of our fruit, so that's available to us year-round as well.
obviously once we are preserving lots of fruit for the winter, we also want to eat well right now. So what are we harvesting? What are we doing? Well, over on my left, we've got spring onions. We produce our own seed, but you can just buy a packet from the garden centre. All you need is a small sprinkle in a medium sized pot every two or three weeks and you'll have a succession of spring onions that will last you right through the year. These will keep growing, they'll still be able to be cut in December. Um, they're brilliant for Thai food, they're brilliant for salads, they're brilliant for Chinese food, absolutely wonderful. We've just harvested our garlic. We plant garlic in September and we harvest in June, July. Horribly expensive to buy the amount that we use for all our home cooking, but you can grow that amount in a pocket handkerchief size of space and it preserves, you don't have to freeze it. All we're going to do is clean that up, plait it, hang it up in one of the barns. Lastly, what we've got there is new potatoes. Main crop potatoes we can buy cheaply, but new potatoes are expensive. So come and have a look at us harvest some of those and you'll see why we do it. July, August and September are the months where we have the best weather. So we've got least rainfall and the most sunshine. And this is the time of year where we need to start taking stock of all of the jobs outside that needs to be done. Masonry painting is one of them. So at the moment, I'm just going round and having a look at all of our barns. And as you can see, this one, the masonry paint has started to peel away. So I am gonna to have to scrape all of this off and resurface the whole area. This is one of the jobs, but there are others too. On many of the barns below the render, we have a layer of exposed brick. And what we've done in the past is we've painted it with bitumen paint just to give it some waterproofing and to protect the brick. But as you can see, that black bitumen paint started to come away. So this is another job that's on our list. And there's one final job that definitely needs to be done before the winter months come in, and that's maintaining the windows. Now our cottage is so old that every window is a slightly different shape, slightly different size, and over time, because the windows when we bought the property were so rotten, we've had to replace every single window of the property, and we've had traditional wooden windows put in. The paint on the wood, absolutely fine. It's holding up to the weather conditions really, really well. But what we're finding is that it started to peel on some of the putty that holds the glass in place. And that's because putty is oil-based, so it doesn't necessarily take paint quite so well. So what I'm gonna to have to do is go around every single window and carefully look for anything which is peeling back, scrape the remaining paint off and apply a new layer so it's fully protected for winter. And it's not just the downstairs windows. I'm gonna to have to get the scaffolding out and do the upstairs windows too so there's a lot to do there. That was a little flavour of what we're up to self-sufficient living in July. It's an enormous subject and it will take us obviously a whole year to talk about the self-sufficient year and quite possibly several years to cover all the things we do. But come back in July we might be able to talk about these enormous chilies growing next week from the seed that we keep ourselves. Is this the kind of thing that the people who've asked us to do more on self-sufficient living and on what to do and when are looking for? If it is, can you let us know down in the comments if there are other things you want to see about the type of life we lead, please tell us. We'll try and make those kind of videos for you. If you've enjoyed today's video, can you spare us five seconds? Give us a thumbs up down below. If you want to see all the future episodes and everything else we do, just tap on subscribe and the bell next to it. You'll hear every time we upload a new video. But for today, thanks for watching. Come back and see us soon. Take care.